And welcome everyone. Iran and the U.S. are locked in a war of words and what many fear is a march toward war. I you mean, do... I'm just amazed by your hands. Can I just... <laughs> <laughs> you guys, this is amazing. Check Look that. Oh my huge. goodness. I love that... it. How do reporters get information from the White House then? I mean, are you just constantly put on hold? Your emails go unanswered? Your phone calls don't get answered? Your text messages uh, fall on deaf ears? A crowbar and, and a dustpan. <laughs> <laughs> what I did see was La La Land as we're talking about that. <laughs> Alicia, Bad choice. I, I just, I, clearly, I mean, I, I just don't understand what the hype was all about. But you also still have some tough days? Yeah. You do? Sure. Really? Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson has tough days when I mean, it comes there, to stuttering? Are... U.S. President Donald Trump and top lawmakers briefed on a series of UFO sightings by military pilots, but it's real life. How dangerous yeah. does it feel to you when you're not just at a Trump rally, uh, working, being heckled, but when you're in a public place as a private citizen. Josh Wingrove, let me just cut you off there. I want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world as we are watching this breaking news happening in Ottawa. U.S. financial markets have begun the week mixed. Investors on Wall Street are looking ahead to planned U.S.-China trade talks. Well, and how does it make you feel today when you hear the U.S. president not only using what is a racist phrase, but doubling down saying it's not racist and having the GOP leadership back him up on that. That's the thing that's really chilling. I know this might bring you really bad memories, but we're going to take you back to high school chemistry class for just a moment. I wasn't smart enough to even do this. <laughs> to even take chemistry. <laughs> exactly. Mr. President, let me get yeah. your expertise on this. As yes. you said, you, know, you wrote a book about this. I, did. I mean, How do you confront violence against women when it's ingrained in some cultures. Aisha's first time on the red carpet. She's got the CNN mic in one hand and a bottle of champagne in the other. <laughs> oh, man, we're all jealous back here in Atlanta. Don't get too rowdy. We're watching you. We'll see you next hour. A vote for you is going to favor Trump. Are you okay with well, that? I'm sure a lot of our international viewers were maybe confused, baffled to see that his poll numbers were surging. But that was amongst Republican voters, right? That is amongst Republican voters. Well, file this under something you never want to see, especially if you have a fear of heights. Can I look away now? The protective layer of the 103rd floor of the Willis Tower Sky Deck in Chicago, completely shattered. I've been up there, my goodness. You know that ledge that kind of sticks out from the building and it's glass and you can see straight down. Yeah, if I saw cracks, I do not know what I would do. That's our time, everyone. Thanks for being with me for CNN Today. I'm Amro Walker. See you next hour. World Sport is next. And Iran heats up. Crisis on the border. Why the U.S. government is sending scores of migrant children back to a facility described as squalid. Plus, media blitz. Boris Johnson forced to finally face the press as he seeks to become the next British prime minister. Welcome, everyone. Iran and the U.S. are locked in a war of words and what many fear is a march toward war. The tones are getting nastier by the day. On Tuesday, the U.S. president responded to insults from Tehran by tweeting that if it attacks anything American, Iran will face overwhelming force and in some areas, obliteration. A few hours ago, President Trump was asked what specific message he wants to send to his Iranian counterpart. There is no message, you know. I'll tell you what the message is. When they're ready, they'll have to let us know. When they're ready, they'll let us know. Very simple. Ready to negotiate, you mean? Ready to do whatever. Doesn't make any difference. Whatever they want to do, I'm ready. Iran's president, meantime, says his country is exercising strategic patience, not fear. Frederick Plaikin is in the Iranian capital with more. Fred Plaikin, CNN, Tehran. Fred, thank you. Now, all this rancor and resentment has many hoping for some kind of diplomatic off-ramp or a cool-down period. But a few hours ago, the U.S. president indicated that's not necessary. You're not going to need an exit strategy. <laughs> I don't need exit strategies. I don't need exit strategies. CNN Global Affairs analyst Max Boot is with us now from our Washington Bureau. Uh, 
not that I'm looking for consistency from the U.S. president, but I mean, this comment that he does not need an exit strategy is coming from a man who's been very critical of U.S. involvement, military involvement abroad, particularly in the Middle East, uh, where there hasn't been a coherent exit strategy. Well, it's not just a lack of an exit strategy on Trump's part. He just does not seem to have a strategy, period. Mm -hmm. He left the Iranian nuclear accord last year, even though the Iranians were complying with it. He has imposed punishing sanctions on Iran. He has threatened Iran with obliteration most recently today. But when it actually came uh, to a moment where he might have actually struck back against Iran militarily last week, he blinked and decided not to do so after Iran shot down a U.S. drone. And so now it's unclear what's going to happen going forward, what Trump expects to happen. I think he seems to think that his economic sanctions will simply force Iran to capitulate and make concessions they were not willing to make when they negotiated the Iranian nuclear accord in 2015. And I don't see much reason uh, that that will happen because we've seen other countries like North Korea and Cuba that have withstood decades of punishing American sanctions. So the question now is, what is Trump's plan going forward? Does he have one? Does he have a strategy? And it's from the outside, it's very hard to detect one. Um, especially, uh, you know, you were just talking about obliteration, these threats. We've heard these threats before, as you mentioned. Uh, let's take a listen to what Trump has said in the past to North Korea. If it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Fire and fury, but boy, has President Trump changed his tone. I mean, now Kim Jong-un is a close pen pal, really, and you know he constantly touts his excellent relationship with the North Korean dictator. I mean, with that kind of patchy track record, uh, I mean, what are the Iranians supposed to, to make of President Trump's threat? Do you take it seriously? I think it's increasingly hard to take anything that Trump takes seriously. I mean, he is an inveterate liar, and he keeps making these grandiose, over-the-top threats and then not carrying them out. Again, last week he blinked much in the way that President Obama had blinked in 2013 when it came to military action when it forced the red line in Syria. And when you have a president who makes threats and doesn't back them up, that creates a dangerous situation where the United States loses credibility. And now, of course, Trump has gone back to making these threats. I mean, I wrote just a few days ago that he needs to either put up or shut up. And mm -hmm. my preference would be that he would shut up. He would stop making mm. these uh, these bellicose noises, which raise the risk of a war that nobody wants, but he just can't help himself. He continues mouthing off, even though his action does not back up his words. And that's a very dangerous disconnect. So if he, did, if he doesn't shut up, as you say, uh, where is his head? I mean, there really doesn't seem to be an off-ramp here. Who is going to de-escalate the situation? It seems like it's up to the Trump administration. Well, that's a great question. And, and Trump has said and, that he is open to negotiations without preconditions. But at the same time, you know, the administration is going to sanction Iran's foreign minister, which is not the way that you would typically initiate a dialogue. And it's not clear what Trump is seeking because Trump talks about ending the Iranian nuclear program. But his aides, such as Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, have made much more expansive and sweeping demands, 12 demands that they want Iran to comply with, including renouncing all of its regional proxies, ending its missile program. Iran is very unlikely to go along with those demands. And so I think the Iranians, just like the rest of us, don't really know what to make of Trump, how to separate the bluster from the bottom line. Right. And again, that is not a situation that as an American president you want to be in where uh, people have, you know, don't understand what you want or whether you're going to attack them, or whether you're going to make peace with them. Uh, that's, that's not a smart move in such a tinderbox situation of the kind that we have right now in the Persian Gulf. Yeah, so many conflicting messages, not only coming from the president himself, but from his closest advisors as well. Max, we'd appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much for that. U.S. President Donald Trump says he's very concerned about the conditions at America's southern border as controversy is swirling over how migrant children are being treated as they are in detention. We've now learned that more than 100 children have been sent back 
to a controversial border facility. Independent monitors called conditions there unconscionable. And in the coming hours, the House is set to vote on a more than $4 billion border funding bill. Despite divisions among Democrats about it, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she expects it to pass. And amid all the turmoil, the acting Customs and Border Protection Commissioner John Sanders has abruptly stepped down. His resignation effective next Friday. A lot going on regarding the southern border. Our Nick Valencia tracking the developments along the border there in El Paso, Texas, where our uh, Sunland Safadi is following the latest developments by Congress on Capitol Hill. Let's begin with Nick. Nick, first to you regarding uh, the, the more than 100 children being sent back after supposedly being under the care of the Health and Human Services. Yeah, it was last week that the Associated Press first reported the conditions in this facility. Uh, just a horrible situation that continues. Nick Valencia, I appreciate you following this very important story. Thank you for that. Let's head out to Capitol Hill now and find out what's happening uh, in the congressional level regarding these children. Sunland Sarfati is standing by. I mean, first off, yeah, how will this bill that Nancy Pelosi believes will pass, how is it going to help the children who've been separated from the parents and caregivers and are, are, are living currently in these deplorable p conditions? as independent monitors say? That's a great question, Amber. Yeah, for each delay, uh, these children continue to be stuck in these horrible conditions. Southern Servati, I appreciate you joining us here from Capitol Hill. Well, for the first few days, he was nowhere to be seen, and now Boris Johnson can't stop making public appearances as he battles to become Britain's next prime minister. He has made a slew of media appearances, but questions about his private life are still following him around. Here's one exchange about a photo of him and his girlfriend that made it to the front pages of the newspapers. When was it taken? Well, I don't get Listen, you, you are... You so are, that's a state you're secret. Asking me, you're asking me... So death. that's a state secret when it's the picture was taken. Secret. So when was it taken? It's not a state secret. It just happens to be something that I don't want to get what? into. Quite testy. When they got down to policy, though, Mr. Johnson was quizzed about his plans for a no-deal Brexit. Ultimately, you prepared to walk away, right? Yes, and and that's of course the other leg of the of the of the of the of the proposal. It is vital as a country that we get ready to come out without an agreement, if we must. FedEx delivers a lawsuit to the U.S. government. The company alleges it has been forced to become a law enforcement agency. Details on that ahead. Also, the U.S. trade war with China has brought this American mine into the spotlight. We'll explain why it's so important when we come back. everyone. U.S. stocks saw their biggest drop in more than three weeks. The Dow fell 179 points after Fed Chairman Jerome Powell took an apparent swipe at President Donald Trump, stressing the central bank is insulated from short-term political pressures to lower rates. The S&P 500 down almost 1%, the Nasdaq down almost 1.5%, led by weakness in technology and industrials. Well, just hours ago, FedEx released its better than expected earnings for the last quarter, one day after announcing it is suing the U.S. government over the Huawei exports ban. FedEx shares have taken a hit, closing down 3%. The company says it shouldn't have to be the federal government's enforcer. CNN business reporter Paul LaMonica explains FedEx's argument. A U.S. Commerce Department spokesperson said FedEx's complaint has not yet been reviewed and that it's looking forward to protecting U.S. national security. American farmers are one of the casualties of President Donald Trump's trade war with China. Those words, a rare admission from Mr. Trump's Agriculture Sec Secretary Sonny Perdue. He remains optimistic that a deal with China will be done quickly. The Trump administration has pledged $25 billion in aid to help farmers who've been battling retaliatory tariffs from China for nearly a year. Here's more of what Purdue told CNN. Mr. Trump didn't look far for his next press secretary. Melania Trump's spokeswoman, Stephanie Grisham, is getting the job. But the news did not come from the U.S. president himself. First Lady Melania Trump announced it on Twitter. 
The question now is, will she make an appearance from the White House press briefing room anytime soon? The last on-camera briefing was back on March 11th. Do the math. That's 106 days ago. Stephanie Grisham will also keep her current job in the East Wing and become the White House Director of Communications. That's a lot of hats to wear in this very busy White House. Let's bring in CNN political analyst Brian Karam, who has been in those briefings with the former White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, who I believe leaves on Friday. Brian, a pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be again. here. Again, lots to talk about. I, I just want to first talk about uh, Stephanie Grisham as the communications director for Melania Trump, because she's been a staunch defender of her, and she's really helped her navigate some patchy waters uh, when it comes to President Trump's um, infidelity allegations, <laughs> sexual assault allegations. How was she as a defender or communications director for Melania? Well, she was very good at keeping her out of harm's way, and she did a lot of that through texting and tweeting, and that's this administration's great way of working with people is to just tweet away 280 mm -hmm. characters of pure nonsense. But uh, she, was, she was good at that, but this is a different uh, bailiwick for her. She was with the president when he first stepped into the uh, Oval, and I remember her for the fir from the first, I guess it was month and a half, two months of this administration. She was there, and she was uh, very happy to be leaving to go over to the uh, East Wing. And now she, I told her she'd be back, and by gum she is, and now she's got four jobs to do, and that gives mm. you an idea of when we'll next have a press briefing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, before I get to that, I mean, what is her view of, of the media? I mean, does she have a, a, a disdain for it the way that Sarah Sanders did? Well, I think everyone in this administration has that stain on them. Uh, they live and work inside a bubble uh, of which, you know, the true believers like Sarah believe that, you know, Donald Trump is the second coming and that uh, everything that she does to further his goals is fine because she's defending truth, justice, and the American way. And a little of that rubs off on everyone. Uh, I think uh, Stephanie is more pragmatic and a little more professional, but again, is going to be f out of her element. I don't suspect that we will have briefings coming back. I believe that Donald Trump believes he's his own press secretary, his own communications director, else he would have found someone that wasn't going to have to wear three or four hats. And you can tell by what he did today when he said no exit strategy, for uh, Iran. He's got no plans for that. He, he thinks it's the Democrats' fault that there's problems on the border. All of that is his branding and his way of communicating. So whoever he places in that office and in that role is merely there to uh, be a wrangler. To I mean, line. the fact that she's wearing so many hats. I mean, communications director for the West Wing. She's also the White House press secretary, <laughs> then also communication director for the First Lady. I mean, how is she going to manage? I mean, being just the White House press secretary isn't the most enviable job. I mean, that's extremely high pressure. No, this is going to be a, a very, it's going to be a lot of pressure. But at the same time, the way they're doing business, it lessens the pressure because if you don't have to do briefings, and remember, that's true. Brett, you know, brief, used to be there was a huge briefing book. You know, and there was an index, and you would say, okay, I want to talk about A, B, C, or D, open up the index, okay, here we go. We don't have that. We don't have, there's no planning here. It's all fly by the seat of your pants. There are themes to this presidency, but strategy is thought of, uh, about on the day of, or the minute of, or when he tweets. And as Bill Shine said, he was there merely as the guy, you know, clean up after the circus left. That's what she's going to be there to do. And mm -hmm. I don't see that that's going to change, and I don't see that she's going to uh, there are she's had some run-ins with the press over from the east wing there are people who have worked with her that are not happy with her i have never had a, a bad interaction with her but you know it's been limited so when yeah. she gets there i guess we'll see but it's not it this isn't like suddenly we're opening pandora's box pandora's box mm -hmm. is open and uh, maybe there's some hope left but everything else has escaped and there's really not a whole lot you can do as a press secretary for this president except sweep up after. Huh. Uh, would you would you be surprised or would you expect perhaps maybe these White House press briefings not just becoming less and less but even doing away with them? I think we have done away with them. I think the damage done to that particular office, I, you have to understand the press secretary is there. It's not a bad thing to put the president's best foot forward. But they treat us as if we're not entitled to information except when it's dictated to us. Everything that has been built up over the last 50 years has been torn down. Mm. There is nothing remaining but rubble. 
and I don't think that uh, Stephanie will build the rubble back. I think she's going to sift through it and just try to make the best of a bad situation. It's going to take a new administration with a dedication to talking to the American people and the people around the world before you get someone in there who actually understands what the job is, how to do it, and how to do it effectively. Right now, it's all propaganda. How do reporters get information from the White House, then? I mean, are you just constantly put on hold? Your emails go unanswered? Your phone calls don't get answered? Your text messages fall on deaf ears? A crowbar and, and a dustpan. <laughs> <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> you know, you Gosh. have sources and you work them. Yeah. And that's what yeah. you got to do. You go back to pounding the pavement. But it's it's difficult because, when, like, as you said, Amber, we don't get, we don't get our, our calls returned. We don't get our uh, emails returned. We don't get texts returned. We try to move forward, and it's all based on what the president wants to do on any given moment, which could change depending on who he talked to last. Well, this is why your job, our jobs are that much more important. Keep pounding the pavement. Brian Karam, I appreciate you joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. That is our time for now. Thanks for being with me. I'm Amro Walker. World Sport is up next.